All right, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. My name is Stan Voiger. I'm a senior fellow here at AI. And I'm delighted to host this event on Paul Tucker's new book, Global Discord, Values and Power in a Fractured World Order. If you're lucky, I think we have a few copies, so you can grab one on the way out. Um, a warm welcome as well to our online viewership. For our online viewers, and for those of you in the room who really like to use hashtags, please submit your questions to Beatrice.lee at AI.org or via Twitter with hashtag AskAIEcon. In his new book, uh, Paul proposes a set of principles that can support international policy coordination and cooperation without surrendering liberal, democ liberal democracies as fundamental values. He applies these principles to uh, a range of controversial uh, controversies around the international economic system and to a number of scenarios for great power competition. Now, um, in addition to uh, um, Paul, um, who uh, is at Harvard Kennedy School, long time at the Bank of England, will be joined by Jeff Frieden, who is a uh, professor of government at Harvard, and by uh, Hal Brands, who is the Henry A. Kissinger Distinguished Professor of Global Affairs at uh, Hopkins Size, and as well as a fellow here at AI. Um, now, proceedings will unfold as follows. Paul will present his book uh, for a little while, then our esteemed discussants, We'll share their perspectives. Uh, we'll have a bit of a conversation among ourselves. We'll take some questions, and we'll uh, wrap up by 3.30. If you're here in person, you, uh, um, again, may well be able to secure a copy of the book. With that, Paul, welcome. Please take it away. I'm going to try and not stumble. I'm tied to a microphone here with a wire. It's going to be a risky operation, but I think we can make it happen. Um, there's a clicker there for you. You can really move that one. Well, this is not going to be easy. I don't know. This is. One of, the, one, of the most, one, of, one of the riskiest situations I've ever been involved in. Stan, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to do this, and thanks very much to, to Hal Brands and Jeff Frieden. Jeff, this also gives me an opportunity to thank you for something I did right at the beginning of this project. One of the great things about Harvard is, is the breadth of its depth. And when I was starting out, I contacted, I don't know, half a dozen or more um, people across Harvard to drill them, grill them on the literature that would be useful. And you were fantastically helpful. I remember the coffee shop we were in, and you were terrific, and I'm really grateful for it. I want to say that in case you hate where it ended up. Actually, I would have said it um, anyway. So. All remaining errors are guests. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, the, the headlines of this book. And forgive me if I glance um, rightward so that I can see the um, screen. The headlines of this book is that e everything that any policymaker in the international sphere has been used to over the past 30, 40 years, going back further really to after the Second World um, War, is, is predicated, depends on peaceful coexistence pr produced by a higher level order. It's kind of been American hegemony. When, when my country was the top dog, the order was more a balance of power between the great European states. But similarly, and in a kind of slightly different way, um, cooperation then, organized cooperation, was as predicated on, on the terms of the higher level order as, um, as is the case today. The, the thing about that is that the, the schemes of cooperation that we have in whatever the field depend upon um, the underlying political cultures of the people of the states that form the higher level order. Um, they reflect the norms of the, of the key states. So in, in the 19th century, it had a classical liberal tinge. In the late 20th century, it's had an American liberal um, tinge. And therefore, when new rising states that come along that are not just rising states, are not just powers, um, but have different legitimation norms at home, different um, um, conceptions of how states should be organized and how states should govern their people and how states should relate to other people. Um, there is not just a challenge in terms of power, but there is a challenge in terms of how the world should be organized in some deeper um, sense. So the thesis of the book, right at the core of the book, the book doesn't have China in the title, but the core of the book is about that party-led China has different conceptions of legitimacy, and therefore it represents a particular kind of challenge 
um, to the Western international world as we've known it. So for those of you who follow this, those realists that say it's, it's merely an inevitable contest of power, it's not about ideology, I profoundly agree, disagree um, with, with that. And in navigating it, the kind of final part of the book in a way, is that in navigating that we need to be sensitive to what our deep political values really are and when we would be compromising them if we compromise in how international organizations and regimes are structured and, and conducted. The book, can I pinch your book? and you can pinch mine, um, the, the book has running through it four scenarios, um, lingering status quo, superpower struggle, new Cold War, and, and new world order. The, I started writing this book in about 2018, and when I started writing it, I thought we were somewhere between lingering status quo and superpower struggle. As I finished it in kind of really 2020, um, polishing it in 21, um, we were between superpower struggle and new Cold War. In fact, I think it's a bit more complicated than that. To kind of jump to one of the conclusions of the book, I think in the monetary financial sphere, we are in somewhere between lingering status quo and superpower struggle. And that's just the value of incumbency of the dollar being the world's reserve currency is enormous in that field. For tr trade and investment, I think we are definitely between um, superpower struggle and new Cold War. I'm not the slightest bit surprised that there is some stepping back in international trade and investment, some deglobalization as people now describe it. And I think the challenge there will be not to kind of overshoot. New World Order, that is, is some way away, but I think the instructive thing for policy-oriented people, and this book is not entirely a policy um, book, is to be aware that there will be new rising um, powers, most obviously India, but also um, quite likely Indonesia and maybe others. You'll see why I stress that in a, in a moment. Well, now. So I, I think this contest is going to go on for a long century. The, the typical comparator is the Second Reich and my country around the turn of the 20th century. That is more a conflict of, of real power. That is a kind of purer case of a rising um, power. There aren't kind of deep, deep differences um, in the, in the way, of, way of life of Germany and the UK during this period. More liberalism in my country, less liberalism in Bismarckian and post-Bismarckian Germany but nothing like the differences between the West, the United States, and China. I think if one had to choose an example from Western history, I would choose France and Britain in the long 18th century, so roughly between 1689 and 1815. And what's instructive about this um, for me is it's everywhere. So the coasts of India, Southeast Asia, Africa, here, of course, at a crucial moment, the French blockades do matter to the, to the outcome and the conduct of that, of that conflict. Uh, it's in everything. It's most certainly in, in commerce as well as in, in troops and navies. Um, there are periods of rapprochement. This is worth bearing in mind given the relatively successful conversation between Li Deji and President Biden in Indonesia last week. There'll be, in my view, there'll be kind of longish periods like that. There was a trade pact between my country and France sometime around the middle of the 18th century. And then as they attempt to kind of settle their differences and then that can't be sustained and they go to war um, again. What lies behind it, at least as seen from Britain, um, the French would have had their own version of this. I don't want to tell an asymmetric story, but as seen from Britain, the problem with France at both ends of the 18th century is that, as Burke said, um, it's not so much the problem of French power as that it's the wrong kind of power. And at the beginning of the 18th century, it's a universalist absolutist monarchy, and at the end of the 18th century, it's a universalist absolutist revolutionary campaign to transform the whole of um, the Western um, world. And... The points I draw from this are, are, well, that's kind of rather similar 
about the norms that are embedded in Chinese institutions as opposed to our institutions. Chapter 9 is, is about that, notwithstanding the efforts of, of Confucian scholars to say you can find things like human rights and Confucianism, which you can, I believe that, just as you can find parallels between Aristotelian virtue ethics and, in particular, Mencius. Um, those have rarely been kind of instantiated, embodied in, in Chinese ruling um, institutions, which I've got a quote that will illustrate that um, later, later on. This is also worth bearing in mind if many economists will say, well, Chinese has got this kind of slightly bubble economy, a bit too based on property, a um, bit like Japan for a while, a bit like parts of the West for a while, and therefore all this is going to explode at some point. There's no inevitability really, but say it does. If and when it does, people will say, that's it, that's it, back to normal, back to normal. Um, the United, United States world-led order. And I shall be thinking, even if I'm the only person in the world, that thinks this, um, well, that'll be true for a while, but after a while, China will again be back in the contest. It has critical mass. It doesn't live under the security umbrella that Japan and Germany did when, during the 1980s, people were worried about Japanese and, and German power, particularly their currencies rivaling the dollar. China is not going to be like that. China's got a, rightfully has a powerful sense of its place in the world and its history, and it has now demonstrated that it can be rich and successful in just about every field. That, that, those are durable things. I was a policymaker, staff of 20 odd years, um, policymaker for just over a dozen years. Um, this is the kind of thing that, that you carry in, carry through the culture of policy institutions. They know now that they can be a very great success having a stock market financial crisis will no more displace them than the calamity, the incompetent calamity of the financial crisis here, um, just a dozen years ago, displaced American power um, permanently. And for, for what it's worth, I think there's no way of, of validating this at all. My subjective um, probability of significant um, conflict, I mean armed conflict over the next quarter of a century is about 10%. Um, you can express that as it not being so, 90%. I think 10% is quite high. It's a completely subjective probability. The point of mentioning it is anyone that's interested in these issues has to have their own subjective probability. I can't imagine going to a meeting and deciding what to do without having at the back of one's mind a kind of range of subjective probabilities um, about things like that. Final thing by way of introduction to... Um, bridge to some more substantive things, perhaps. Uh, so this is caricature. If you study international relations, of course, this isn't literally true. It's, it's, it's rather as though at some point in grad school, um, you're each given a ticket to go and report to a particular room. And when you go into the room, you discover whether you're a Hobbesian and you think it's all about kind of power or whether you're a Kantian and you think it's all about values um, and human rights or whether you're a Grotian rationalist cooperator and you're going to be interested in economic institutions and things like that. And the book, is, the book is not a caricature in that sense, I hope. But what it does say is if we turn to David Hume, we can find a way through this where all of power and interests and values um, matter. So let me, let me ask a question at this point. This is thing I used to do in my former life. It's probably quite irritating. Who has heard of Document 9? Who has heard of the seven no's? Okay, so I haven't heard of Document 9. Um, it, it came out just as I was leaving office. I'd like to think that if I'd carried on for a few years longer, I would have heard of it. It was leaked from the Central Committee, um, and it articulates seven knows it wasn't for publication to the outside world and i'm just going to read some of them this this is paraphrase and the, and the books are quote well quote of a translation into english no to promoting constitutional democracy or universal values no to civil society individual rights um, no to neoliberalism meaning total marketization no to journalism in the sense of freedom of the press contrary to party discipline 
um, no to historical nihilism against the history of the party in New China, and rather differently, no to any questioning of the socialist nature of socialism with Chinese characteristics. So, this, you know, it's not a surprise in one sense, but people would say, actually, there isn't a big ideological difference, really. There's some convergence. Liberalism of the economy will lead to a li liberalism of politics. This is quite succinct. Steve and I were both bureaucrats. We can... We've written documents for that kind of bullet points of high-level statements that people have gone and read out. Um, this, is, this is important. It was sent to a, lots of civil society in, in China um, to, to kind of inform their thinking in the way ahead. This one year after Li Deji um, becomes leader. So guiding principles that run through the book, they emerge about halfway through, is avoid wishful thinking. Thucydides never actually says that in terms notwithstanding what people suggest, but it definitely implies it. And I'm going to give an example of, I think this capital um, is prone to wishful thinking. The second thing is that when we think about survival, and people say actually what matters is the survival of the state, what we really mean or should mean is the survival of a way of life, if our way of life is valuable to us, meaning the way we kind of fa have found our way to cooperate together. Um, that we should aim to do so without dominating others. Um, and crucially, this is a world, and this is where the book begins, in fact, um, this is a world where you can't live in policy silos. You, in, in my generation, you could be a monetary financial policymaker without knowing about trade policy. You need to know about trade economics, but not trade policy. You could, you could span all of that and not need to know about um, environmental policy or security policy. Everything is now connected. The book begins with a story of someone walking into my room, this is completely true, uh, sometime during the last financial crisis, and saying, um, the Federal Reserve just refused India a swap line. It doesn't matter what a swap line is. It's a line of credit from the Federal Reserve, the US, to India in exchange for something. And my response is, don't they know India is going to be a power? And... The point of my outburst to the staff, and it goes like this, what are they up to today, um, was not that the Federal Reserve should be doing foreign policy, but that I thought, wow, the stakes are big here. This doesn't feel like central banking. This feels like something much bigger than, than central banking, given the, um, the future. Um, I, I end up with arguing for that we can cooperate more with, her, with whom, more with those with whom we have more in common and fear least, or fear less. So it's a series of concentric circles. In the outer circle, there's peaceful coexistence. Unlike John Rawls, you can't pretend that societies that in his terms aren't liberal and decent are all small. They could be really big and powerful. Rawls doesn't entertain the possibility that there's somebody out there really different from us um, who's a massive um, power. I mean, we need somehow to contrive peaceful coexistence in the outer sphere. As we move in, some of our deep political values kick in. It's much more difficult for us to commit to cooperating in risky ways um, with people who breach the most fundamental basic rights norms. I don't, I don't mean norms in a textbook, nor positive rights in international law. As we move inwards, of course, this is perspectival. Everyone has their own, every state has its own concentric circle. As we move inwards, um, you can find more and more to cooperate with. From that, um, drawing on our deep values, I have some principles that should guide policymakers. I mean, these are meant to be serious principles that guide them, whether or not they do. Um, one is, be very careful about delegating powers to judicial bodies um, if they can make high policy. And if judicial bodies and the managers of international organizations do find themselves in that position, they should exercise self-restraint. I want to give an example of the first. I'll say something. I think I've got two or three minutes left. I'll say something about the trade system, something about the monetary system. Probably just three sides left. Does... How many people know about the um, state-owned enterprises subsidies case in two, roughly 2011? Okay. So 
China's state-owned enterprises subsidize exports. Um, the United States objects to this as an illegal subsidy and wants to put in place what are called countervailing measures. Think of them as tariffs that offset the, the subsidy. China challenges the right of the United States to do that. The case goes through the WTO dispute panel up to the appellate board. The case turns on whether state-owned enterprises are, a public, are, in quotes, a public body. The, the, the appellate board concludes that they're not um, public bodies, and therefore the subsidies are legal. Now, at one level, this is chapter 17, this is crazy because all of this is an emanation of the party, and therefore, of course, it um, reflects party policy. Everything is a public body in that sense. This is like negotiating with 18th century or early 18th century France and not thinking about Louis XIV. And yet, in making their case at the WTO, the US trade team didn't mention the party. Um, if, if that is true, I've read things that say it is true. If it is true, it was incompetent. Um, and if it's not true, then of course um, there was competence and the appellate board was even more incompetent because they didn't hear the argument. Um, the problem here, though, is they're all, they're in every system there are court decisions which one doesn't like, and to the extent that they're, const they're not constitutional, then the assembly changes forward-looking policy. WT can't, WTO can't do that because compared with the GATT, everybody has a veto. So actually what a system where the appellate board is, is, is making high policy. I, uh, my considered view for what it's worth is the appellate board is just out of its depth, just as I think the Supreme Court here for many, many years, decades really, has been out of its depth, deciding things beyond um, their competence. This, this is why preferential trade agreements, regional trade agreements, are gonna be the way forward, because it's hard to get, when, you, if, when everyone has a right of veto, it's quite hard, absent a massive crisis, for people to vote on giving away their veto, because someone will veto it. Um, but this leads to, well, if preferential trade agreements are the way forward, the Trump administration backing out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership it might have been a policy mistake, like a big one. Um, let me close with something. I was going to say something about cross-border investment and security. Let me instead close with something on, on the dollar. Um, there's a curious thing about in the, in, in the modern world, by which I mean the European modern world, so from about 15, 1600 onwards, um, security relationships and currency relationships have reinforced each other. Um, the, the use of the dollar around the world is underpinned by its security relationships. If you doubt that, the classic case is mid-1970s, Britain Woods has collapsed, US is in a mess for all sorts of reasons, a mission, I think joint state treasury, but I may have that wrong, goes to Saudi Arabia and says, we will continue to provide security umbrella for you as long as you commit to continue invoicing oil and dollars. This isn't, this isn't just a kind of economic technocrats thing. This is underpinning the geographical use, including in, in, and, and commodity use of the dollar as the world's um, premier. Um, reserve currency. It goes the other way around, of course, as well, because having the premier reserve currency um, makes one's debt cheaper, public sector and private sector, a cushion during crises, um, and so on. So that an unknowing headquarters for the US leadership of the free world is the Federal Reserve um, building. I mean, I'm not sure they should be parading that, but it is something that will become more evident as the decades pass. So let me end on this note. When the debate about um, the debt ceiling occurs here, and people kind of do partisan politics around it, and when people lobby um, against making the so-called shadow banking industry kind of safer than it is, dealing, addressing its fragilities, um, the, the people that play these games, um, they're interfering in that national security and the interests of the West. They're playing, they think they're playing a low-level game, and they're playing the highest-level game possible. Something I'm certain of from my previous life is it bridges into my 
second career um, is if the, if the reserve currency is so important to the, to the role of the United States, the role of the reserve currency is underpinned by complete confidence around the world that this currency will not lose its value, that it will not be subject to violent shocks from within its own country. So there opens a door there to domestic currency and politics, but take the last, if you take nothing else seriously, take the last point very seriously. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, so I want to first uh, turn to turn to hell. Hell, as you as you heard, we we no longer want to do policy silos. And you, of course, have written multiple books with uh, the term grand strategy in the title, which means that you float far above policy silos, as we mortals know them. And so, I was curious, what did you think of the book? What did you think of Paul's uh, remarks? Yeah, thanks. It's it's. Um it's a real pleasure to help introduce the, the book, uh, and I, I got a lot of, out, of, out of Paul's introductory remarks as, as well. There, there's a whole lot um, to say uh, in, in praise of this book. It's, it's obviously deeply researched. It's informed by personal experience. It's, it's very rich in analysis. It's incredibly timely in the subjects uh, that it raises. I think the sort of the core question, how liberal democracies can maintain their values and their traditions, even as they deal with a degree of interdependence with powerful and increasingly coercive autocratic states, that, that may be kind of the central question of global politics and US foreign policy today. Uh, and so it's, it's sort of right on the money in that sense. I think um, I really appreciated the fact that the book uses as its central historical analogy not the usual historical analogies. right? It's not Athens or Sparta or the US and the Soviet Union or even uh, the UK and, and Germany, the Anglo-French rivalry in the long 18th century. It, uh, it is not a short book. I guess you would say that it is, it is weighty with knowledge. Um, uh, but I appreciated reading it none, nonetheless. Um, and I, I think it's, it's interesting. You, know, you mentioned sort of the, the timeline on which you, you wrote this from 2018 to roughly 2020. I think it's, it's interesting that some of the ideas that you advance in the book are already finding their way into the policy discourse to a greater extent. And, and so, you know, for instance, this idea that um, policy regimes with universal memberships or universal aspirations shouldn't preclude deepening cooperation with coalitions of the willing or coalitions of like-minded countries. It's, it's interesting. You get a very similar flavor from the Biden administration's most recent national security strategy, which talks about just this approach when it comes to everything from pandemic response and prevention to, to dealing with climate change. You try to build the largest possible coalition to deal with these issues while recognizing that to get real work done on these things, you may have to work with smaller groups uh, of, of countries. So uh, you know, I could, I could go on and on about this. I'm, I guess I'm gonna throw out just kind of maybe three, three or four questions I had in, in reading the book, and I, I leave to, to Paul and Stan whether, you know, how you wanna incorporate these into the discussion. But these, these were things that just kind of occurred to me in thinking about the core arguments of the book and then listening to you, to you talk about it here. And, and so one is, I wonder if you could say a bit more about something that's referenced in the preface to the book, which is that you, you obviously wrote the book before the Ukraine war started, but it's been published amidst the war in Ukraine. And so how, how is that uh, conflict and how has the growing danger of war in the Taiwan Strait, whether the probability of it is you know, 1% or 10% or 50% or whatever the case may be, how, how, is that, how does that affect the way you think about the central arguments of the book if, if at all, and in particular, does it make lingering status quo potentially look more likely than it did when you started in, in 2018? Because there's one interpretation of the Ukraine crisis that sort of, you know, it underscores dollar centrality and a lot of the things that, that would go into lingering status quo. Um, second uh, question would be, uh, you lay out some key scenarios here about possible global futures, but you actually ended your talk um, by mentioning American domestic politics, right? And obviously there, there's, a, there's a profound interplay between these two things. And so I'm wondering if you might just sort of think out loud about how you connect the global futures you moot in the book to possible political futures in the United States. And so if you're doing this in sort of a very rough way, you could say there are four political camps in the United States, right? Progressives, centrist Democrats, centrist Republicans, and the America First Republicans. Uh, 
you know, where, where do those groups stand on the issues that you raise and how might political developments here influence the global scenarios that you, you talk about? Um, maybe it's just two, two more. The, the, the first of these is, one question I've been thinking a little bit about is, you, you talk about the importance of reflecting values in policies and international policy regimes, but of course that, that raises the question of how do we define and delimit the values that we are trying to protect in, in these regimes, given that there are real clashes within democratic societies about what their founding values should, should be. And so you can say, for instance, that international policy regime should reflect a commitment to basic human rights, but my definition of basic human rights may be very different than your definition of, of basic human rights, and so on and so forth. And, and so are we thinking about values in a sort of classically liberal sense? Are we thinking about values in a procedural sense and a sort of a commitment to, to um, liberal democracy as it's embodied in various procedures, or is it, is it something else? And then the last, the last one is, this is sort of a hobby horse of, of mine. Um, and it's, I, did, I did the thing where you find like one line in the book and then you, you build a comment around that even though it's not maybe the, the core of it. But you, know, you, you make a critique of US policy toward China at, after the Cold War that I, I mostly agree with, right? And, and so you say basically that the engagement policy was short-sighted, it was a bit naive in the sense that it was premised on an idea that by integrating China into the international system, you would actually change the underpinnings of that country's foreign policy, if not of its domestic politics as, as well. And, and I, I buy that to the most part. The, the question I have wrestled with, though, is you know, what, what was the alternative to that policy in the early 1990s, right? And, and, and what was the policy that should have been followed. Because I can imagine two critiques of the engagement policy. One is that it was a policy that made sense in the context of the time, but was continued for a decade plus after its sell-by date. And I think that's the one I would identify myself with. There's another critique, though, that says that it, it was always a bad bet, and it always should have been understood to be a bad bet, and we should have been, done something different. And so I'm curious about what that something different would be. Would it just be attaching greater conditionality upon China's insertion in the global economy and global regimes like the WTO would it be something else. I'd just be interested to hear you think aloud uh, about that. You could that. call that the, the Nancy Pelosi position. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. Um, and so, anyways, these are, I had a bunch more things that yeah. the, the book triggered for me, but, but it, I had a, a wonderful time sort of thinking about a lot of the issues that it raised, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm just glad to be able to participate in the launch here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hal. I'm going to, uh, very well structured. It's very easy for me as a moderator. So I'm going to keep these questions slash book ideas here, and then I will, I'm going to elicit the, the Jeff first. For you. Great. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to, to read Paul's latest book. Um, always, always interesting and always weighty in more ways than one. Um, I, I, in reading the book, I reflected on when I was a graduate student at Columbia, to advance to candidacy in the program, you had to do a number of things. You had to take two days' worth of written exams in international relations theory. You had to take a day's worth of written exams in diplomatic history. And you had to take a year of international law at the law school. So reading the book was a little bit like going back to that period in my graduate school. Did you get a PhD for this? I did. Well, I got advanced to candidacy, and then I had to write a dissertation. So, um, so it, is, it is a heady mixture, and I would say a tour de force of international relations theory, international law, uh, diplomatic history, political philosophy, political economy, and a whole lot else. Um, motivated, I think, by the fact that we live in a world of contradictions. We see financial globalization at a level we have never seen before, and yet a global financial crisis showing the weakness of that. We see success stories of development all around, but failed states as well. We see that we are in the heyday in some way of globalization, but a backlash against globalization in some of the leading countries that have made, made it up. We see the end of the Cold War, um, but at the same time the rise of China and 200,000 casualties in a land war in Europe. Uh, so all of these contradictions, I think, inform or at least motivate us to think about the state of the world. I would have to say, I think, that the contradiction or tension of greatest interest to Paul is a little bit more abstract and in some ways a little more fundamental which is the potential contradiction between the demands of global economic growth, stability, peace on the one hand, 
and political legitimacy on the other, our values. And, and his attempt to wrestle with that tension is immensely engaging, immensely erudite, immensely challenging, and it's full of, I think, excellent and sensible ideas, especially about the world economy, which after all is both his and my area of specialization. I have to say, and this is sort of the question that I would focus on in, in speaking with Paul about this, that I can't, I can't say I left with a clear sense of how to square that circle or resolve that contradiction between the needs of global political and economic stability and cooperation on the one hand and political legitimacy on the other. And maybe that's because, at least in part, Paul is an adept of and enamored of political philosophy, normative political philosophy, while I am a victim of positive political economy or a positive historical political economy, all of which means that Paul looks at the world and asks how it could be and how it could be better, while I tend to look at the world and wonder why it is the way it is. And those are different ways of thinking about the world. Um, not mutually exclusive, obviously, but different. So when I think about what I know of the international economic order and how it's emerged and how it's developed over time, what I think I know is that it has only been sustained with purposive cooperation among the major powers and that that cooperation has only ever been sustained um, when there was domestic political support for the sacrifices and compromises necessary to make that cooperation work. That's Paul's last point, really, in a way, or it's a, it's a, it's a, 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 a squidge on, on Paul's last point. So the international order, paradoxically, depends on the domestic political economy of support for national policies that, that make it up. I think, parenthetically, as Paul implies, I think, and as we know, at this moment, whether such support exists or not and will persist is very much in doubt. Um, for me, this is a pragmatic issue of whether the international economic order, either as currently constituted or any international economic order, can deliver the goods to those who matter politically. We don't have an international economy for its own sake. We have it because it provides benefits to the people that inhabit the worlds that make it up. And if the international economic order isn't delivering the goods, it doesn't deserve to continue. Uh, and, and that is a challenge that we all face in thinking about the international economy, international economic policy. Now, my question, my, I, I call it a problem, but it's my problem, not Paul's, but my question is whether this support is democratic or legitimate, I don't know. And I don't really know how to tell. I do think that, and this is in a sense a challenge perhaps to the notion of democratic legitimacy, that when I think of the eras in which, or the areas in which international cooperation has been sustained and maintained, it's because powerful interests have wanted it to be so. We get trade liberalization not because the masses of voters have been convinced that David Ricardo was right, but because there are powerful firms and industries that want access to foreign markets. We get financial liberalization or harmonization of financial regulation not because People have been convinced by um, academics, who should not and don't convince many people, but because powerful financial institutions want regulation to be harmonized for their own purposes. Is that democratic? Is it democratically legitimate? I don't know. I know that many public goods, including many international public goods or global public goods, have differential benefits. So it may be that trade liberalization is good for everyone at some level, or is good for the world economy, but it's particularly good for big exporting firms or multinationals, or whoever you want to identify as the powerful interests that lie behind it. Um, so if they benefit most, why shouldn't they play a more important role in promoting them and trying to encourage them? So this is, in a sense, perhaps a cynical and naive, if you, can be, if you can be both cynical and naive at the same time, I think it was both naive and cynical of you saying, yeah, we, we'll get these cooperative ventures and these global public goods if powerful enough special interests support them. That's my positive view of how these things happen. Whether, how that fits into a political theory or a, a normative political philosophy of whether 
these things are politically legitimate is, I think, a thorny political and theoretical issue to which I don't have the answer. And I'm not quite sure how Paul would parse that in the, in the current context. So, and I raise this because I think Paul has broader concerns in mind than my you know, mundane pragmatic ones, which is whether cooperative relations among Asia's nations can ever be legitimate and democratic in the, in the contemporary world. Um, I have trouble thinking about legitimacy, not because I don't think it matters, but because despite Paul's best efforts, I'm not sure how to define it, I'm not sure how to know it when I see it, and I'm not sure how to know what is and is not legitimate. So I can easily recognize that the issues that Paul raises are extraordinarily important, but I find it difficult to accompany him all the way on his journey, but I wish him luck. Thank you, Jeff. So let's, uh, let's go to, let's turn to that topic, uh, Paul, if you, if you don't mind. So we can, that one. Yes, so yeah. that one, but I think it fits in nicely with yeah, yeah. Hal's third question, of how do we define the limit? So, there you go. So think of legitimacy as something that matters in the real world. That, um, that, and think locally, don't think internationally. Think of a village or a province or a state or a country. Um, among those who are capable of resisting, actively or passively, um, they effectively choose whether to actively or passively resist authority. If they can resist but choose not to, they are acquiescing in the structure of power in that political community. That's the essence of the Humean um, view. The, and in a sense, the one then just has to, in deciding whether it's there, one has to decide whether they're, they're kind of brainwashed, kind of Frankfurt School type point, mm -hmm. and, and whether they really, who does really have a capacity to, to, to resist. But otherwise, in our societies, we're pretty well all capable of resisting, certainly when we get together. Um, so stack that. Then f for me, the, it's also pragmatic. It's also pragmatic in that we shouldn't, we shouldn't um, get out too far in this international stuff to the point where we really are starting to jeopardize local legitimacy. Now, the terms of local legitimacy can adapt, um, so it has to be a judgment. And so your, your account, which it's um, firms and others are kind of pursuing their commercial interests, but they also have interests and other people have interests in the domestic base, we happen to live in states, remain, remaining stable and not collapsing into illegitimacy. So, and if you think about the trade one, the, the, the trade one is very interesting, because in a sense, this is the Trumpian um, objective, that it went too far and, and undermined um, domestic legitimacy. I think that argument should be taken seriously. I don't think it's completely compelling, because really the question is, well, actually, lots of the costs, this is a fantastically rich society, as is mine on the other side of the ocean, uh, lots of the distributional costs um, could have been addressed with domestic policy. And that when people say, oh, it's a terrible, trade is making these, these townships worse off, actually, it's a compound pro proposition. Um, the trade is kind of making them slightly worse off, and we're not using any of our own capabilities to do anything much about it. And this is kind of real politics, in a sense. Domestic politics, I completely agree with you and Hal. And then to answer Hal's part of it, I think what we really need to hold on to are the things which in pluralistic societies, both across the Western world, by the Western world I'm including, we need a new term for West. What I mean by the West, the global West. Is, is the global West. The OECD, it's, yeah, like the global it's, South. It's, yeah, but it's, it's got, even global yeah, West has the West in it. I mean, I'm including Japan and South Korea and um, states like that that have constitutional Uruguay. democracy. Uruguay, <laughs> yeah. Um, we, the key things are more procedural, separation of powers, rule of law. Rule of law, not in some abstract sense, but that if someone here is sued or prosecuted, um, they have a right to discovery and to their case being made. This is deeply ingrained in my country's history. And you know, that part of my country's history has to hold is true. And it's incredible. Um, and I think we should not, in international organizations, kind of sign up to making policy via, via processes that are just completely orthogonal. 
um, to, to, to that. The basic human rights thing, um, I, I mean basic human rights as a term of art as applied currently by international courts. So, you know, someone does genocide. I, I mean, the way, one way of thinking about that isn't just in terms of moral horror. Um, it's if they treat their own people like that, how would they treat us if they could? And, and actually, that itself is a judgment. I mean, that's a judgment that my side of the Atlantic could reasonably have asked about this side of the Atlantic for much of the last 150 years. But it's a judgment to say, well, actually, they don't always treat their people decency, decently by our lights, but we don't perceive the United States as a, um, as a threat. So running through it, this is the Bernard Williams part of the book, running through it is, is a kind of very realist approach to, to um, politics and political theory. But where realism includes our values, where realism isn't, isn't just about power. I mean, the people say these values don't matter. I mean, why do they want to hold on to their state? And you can think of examples. The best example came to me after I'd finished writing. There's a book by Jonathan Kirshner about classical liberalism. This is an incredible example of interwar France, which was kind of falling apart. And I haven't studied this carefully, but he kind of, he and others advanced the proposition that the reason France collapses so easily and collaborates so appallingly with the Nazi regime is because their, the legitimacy of their own society had crumbled away. Now, if there's even a germ of truth in that, it makes domestic legitimacy of the highest possible importance. But let me push on that a little more, because you, you, know, you can't just say we're going to outsource this to the UN Human Rights Council, right? No. The, it's not that easy to come up with what's, what's the set of, of principles we really can do without. Jeff would say, you know, we pick the five items with the most successful lobbyists, right? Um, but I think what, what Hell was saying is, is, is true, too, right? It's not that you, there's a, a range, there's, I think, a number of minimalist items, sort of, sort of due process type things that people can agree on. But, you know, you have countries that, that, have, that pride themselves on having a feminist foreign policy or one that really centers LGBTQ rights. That, I, I don't think it's as easy as saying, you know, there are basic human rights, um, you know. I know. A society in the, uh, where people are in the face of genocide or slavery have almost zero capacity to transform or reform that society in the slightest. A society... But so that's a very a minimalist society, core. Yes, of, yes, but okay. no, no, it's basic. It's basic. It's the basic ingredient of fear. That, that if you have people that are treated dreadfully... To be clear, I agree with you. Women basic sounds a, better than minimalist. Well, for a long time, there was actually... It turns out there was space in our society for them in slow motion to create more space for themselves. That is not true um, um, of slavery. This is the example that Williams gives of the helots in Sparta. The helots had no space, um, uh, you know, nor did they have any actual physical space to fight back because the Spartans would go over the hill. Um, it's a very nice hill, by the way, if any of you have the chance to go there, and, 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 and kind of wage local war on them. This was slavery as a state of internal war. That's what I mean by the most elemental rights, the rights that give you the capacity to search for more rights. I mean, and these aren't natural rights in some sense. These are kind of from the very basic, after the very basic ones, they're all positive rights, uh, which people na you know, might naturally want. But that doesn't make them natural rights. But so that doesn't constrain foreign policy. That yes, I think it, it, well, I think it might but quite certainly a lot. Hungary should be a welcome member of an so, international order based on that minimalist. So, think, well, so you might have weighed Tiananmen Square after, um, in, if you're sitting around the table thinking, what, what's our policy going to be to um, WTO entry? Deng Xiaoping still in charge. This goes to your fourth, fourth question. So my version of this is that it's, there's, it's a, my position isn't that it was inevitable that it was going to be bad. My position is that it's really, really poor policy. It's incompetent policy to have all your chips on the happy story. Um, don't, and, and it's all the more extraordinary because everyone knows, and it's not just because researchers have shown it, but you kind of people just know it, that Germany and, and England were fantastically integrated in the run up to the First World War, um, and that didn't stop them fighting. So, of course, I mean, I believe the, the, 
book ends on the note that commercial society, a human commercial society, can broaden our sense of we over time in slow motion. But it doesn't prevent atrocities on the way. So when atrocities occur, and that's what happened in 1989, that's something you'd say, well, what, what do we think? We you know there are, some, are there some risks here. How do you, do you... Well, I, I think there's, a, there's actually, in some ways, a, uh, a more profound point you can make about the failure of, of integration of, of China. And, and so it, it was never the case that the U.S. placed all of its eggs in one basket. I mean, there, there were two halves of U.S. policy toward China, right? There was the integration piece, and then there was the hedging or the deterrence piece, right? And so yes. the United States yes. self-consciously decided we're not deconstructing our alliances in Asia, even though the Soviet Union's gone, yes. we're going to leave 100,000 plus, so, so on and so forth, right? When the Chinese... Um, uh, do what they did to Taiwan in August back in 1995, 1996, the U.S. sends a couple of carrier strike groups to the region to let them know that's, that's not okay. But so, so why then did the policy fail? Because undoubtedly it, it failed. One was that China's growth of its economic power and then of its military power was just far more explosive than the architects of U.S. policy had predicted. And so they had, they had less time than they thought, right? And so the bet was that the system could transform China before China could transform the system. But because China became so much more powerful so much more quickly, that bet no longer was able to pay off. But it, here, it, here's the, the key point. The ability to maintain balance in the policy was compromised over time by the very fact of integration with China. Because when you integrate yeah. with China, yeah. you create powerful forces within yes. your own society yes. that yes. resist a harder-edged policy. And that's the trap we've been stuck in for the past 15 years. I completely agree with that. And of course, that's the story of how my country gets over the great right. protectionist free trade battles in the beginning of the first third of the 19th century. The coalitions are shifted because interests are shifted by, by moving towards and this free trade. Jeff finds it difficult to decide what's legitimacy. Which is <laughs> I think, by the way, that there's also a silo point going on as well. I mean, John Eikenbury made your point about actually security policy was fairly sensible and was risk averse after um, Deng Xiaoping's changes. And I, and yeah. I, I completely concede that point, and I rather regret not being, the point's kind of in the book, but it's not clear enough in the book, and I regret that. But I think there is a siloism going on as well. And that's, I think siloism is fine. You know, I lived in my own silo for a long while, if you like. It's, siloism is fine when the stakes are low. Siloism mm -hmm. is really stupid when the stakes are high. So Jeff, why is the military-industrial complex not uh, not addressing that side of the <laughs> Well, I think Hal's point about the the uh, in, perhaps inevitable effect of economic integration, even if China had not grown as rapidly as it had, the the one might have, to, if one were poor, one might have taken into account the fact that that making a billion people available to American firms would have an impact on domestic politics yeah. in the United States. An important point to make. Can I, can I raise a, what I think is a related point, with, actually within our shared realm, yeah. right? Yeah. I think of a lot of these issues as having arisen first in Europe, which is decades ahead in terms of economic integration and also political integration, cooperation as well. And you know, so as you and I, we've talked about this before, but, but I firmly believe that once Europe got to the level of having the, level, the degree of commercial and financial integration that it did by the 1990s, maintaining separate currencies was politically unsustainable because it meant that any individual member of the common market, the single market, could depreciate its currency at will. And so the only logical thing to do then is to have a common central bank. Now, that to me, flies in the face of all your principles of legitimacy because as the German Constitutional Court has continually tried to point out, there's no democratic accountability for the central bank. So, so this is a very, if you will, arcane and specific example, but, but I think that you would agree that there were inevitable pushes in the direction of creating an illegitimate institution. How do you deal so, with that? So my concept of legitimacy doesn't rely entirely on democracy. So the first thing is, um, what you're describing is exactly why my, country, my own country stayed out. Of course. Um, that, that in terms of my concentric circles, we're choosing not to be part of that concentric um, um, circle. The, the, the kind of 
Assessing legitimacy is, is kind of hard until it's too late. I accept this. When Greece was in real difficulty, and of course I was involved in the Greece crisis in various ways, but in something apart from um, that, my professional stuff, I was on holiday in Greece during, I go, I go to Greece a lot, and I'm in a cafe somewhere, and um, this woman has no idea who I was, as it were, and I, have, I go pay for my coffee, and she says, five euros, please, euros. <laughs> and I almost wept, and I thought they may not have voted for it, because except they later did um, vote for it. I wouldn't underestimate the attachment to European ideas in, or the idea of Europe, in a whole swathe of Europe that goes down the west and across the south. I, I think that I don't think that was true, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe. I don't, I don't see why any country should be expected, countries should be expected to adapt so quickly to so much. I think there is a kind of improvidence in the attitude to more and more members of the Euro area. I think Croatia may recently have become um, a member. And I, I would probably be more slow motion than them for, for your reason. And I think it would be probably a good idea for nations to have referenda on, on whether to join. But you have to think, unlike my country, you have to think carefully about how to design referenda. There's a bit of a tension between that and your your opposition to veto rights, right? Because you, right, the way this integration happens. It's well, you'll lose it, you're, you're voting in a way to, it matters a lot whether there's an exit route. So the, the it's, it's, I would have said this before Brexit, it was always clear that it was gonna be possible to leave the single market. It might be costly, it might not be, who knows, but it's, it's plainly feasible. It's tremendously difficult to leave the, the euro area, again during the crisis, we must be careful not to get too far into baseball. Someone very senior from Berlin called me and said, do you think there are any ways um, for a country to leave the euro? And I said, I've got only one piece of advice, is that no one you speak to is going to say anything intelligent to you about this question, which is my way of saying no. I wanted them to take away, you know, you're going to, a lot of people are going to tell you it's feasible. And so you want concentric circles that you can easily move between? Is that it's, not, it's not so much that I, I, I kind of normatively want them, you're right, but I think it's inevitable that there are them. I think it's inevitable that we are pulled to, to cooperate more with those that, so, we, that we have more in common and fear um, less, and that we make a mistake and, and put ourselves in jeopardy when we, we blind ourselves to that and, and leap in. So, you know, my problem with the WTO design is partly the terms of Chinese entry and partly giving everybody rights of veto in a kind of excess of zeal of universalism. Behind the book in this sense is, you know, there are two, you know, famously there are two kinds of liberalism, or many kinds of liberalism. There are kind of more pluralistic liberalisms and there are more universalist, if you like, Kantian, types of liberalism. I think the latter are incredibly dangerous. History, history doesn't end. Um, and it's the idea that you've written down, you know, Steve and I were trade experts and we go and we we're pretty good at what we did and we go and negotiate um, some trade agreement. And we say, we give everyone a veto. So we say, that's it, we've got that. <laughs> we've done it. We've done it. We've written the perfect trade agreement for the next, you know, 100 years. This is ludicrous ludicrous. No one sensibly. Think about monetary policy, you change it every eight weeks in case you've got it wrong. You call it a framework. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, and so what you end up with is you want to have, you really want to have concentric circles where everyone has veto rights but no one ever exercises them. Right? That's, the, that's the kind of solution that game theorists would come up with for sure. But, yeah, uh, well, I... I, I uh, <laughs> I, think, I, I think the mechanism design game... Well, actually, uh, a subtext in my book is... Is that, that Bernard Hume is, is, is developed all of game is theory? That, yeah. is that, is it's that not the, very subtle. It's is it the, yeah, the Roger Bison yeah, yeah, um, yeah, level yeah, game yeah, theory? Yeah, There's yeah, a bit more going on because yeah, there are games embedded in games. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the new, I remember. When, when we're, I we're, we're, getting, we're getting distracted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, can, I, can I answer the Ukraine question? Yes. Because I think the Ukraine question is incredibly interesting and, of course, kind of topical and serious. So, you know, in terms of the book, I think of the Ukraine, the war on Ukraine as the first proxy war, um, first serious proxy war. I, I can't see how it would have been um, 
I think it would have been a lot harder for Putin to prosecute this war without at least the acquiescence and in advance knowing acquiescence of a much greater, of a much greater um, power. That's the first thing to say about it. The second is the one little bit of the book I, I, I amended, maybe even during proofreading, I can't remember, was that I had thought that, um, that Putin would move east only if and when she moved against Taiwan. I thought the smart thing for them to do would be to stretch the West onto, or the global West onto two um, fronts um, completely unprepared. Instead, I think if, if I were advising Xi, I would, be ex I would advise him to be extremely irritated with Putin for giving away that optionality um, and also for bringing the North Atlantic relationships um, back together in tighter form. I mean, the extent to which um, people mainly here have, have prosecuted the argument that NATO and the North Atlantic Alliance can't amount to anything because it hasn't had to do anything, kind of almost doesn't understand anything about the, the, the lived life of institutions. Um, it's not inevitable that it remained intact, but the fact that they hadn't to do anything certainly wasn't any kind of argument that it wasn't intact, and the people that um, advance that argument, in a sense, have, dis have, have been exposed as not knowing very much about the institutions that they were criticizing. I mean, the kind of inside the institutions, as it, as it were. And I think all of that is a, is a great piece of luck, that if we've made mistakes in the West, and we certainly have, um, we've, I think we've had a piece of good fortune at the expense, horribly, of the Ukrainian people. I think another piece of good fortune is that she wants to do a third term. I very much hope that he will do a, a fourth and fifth um, term. Um, so I think some things are kind of, you know, it's not only um, us that will make mistakes, um, others will make their own mistakes, and this may lead the world to a happier place, but with kind of small horrors on the way, not small for the people that are suffering them, of course. And so you agree with all of these developments have made the status quo a bit more? Sorry? And so you agree, you, you, would, you agree with Hal's suggestion that Ukraine war has made the status quo scenario a little more? It tilts it a bit more, more in, that, in that direction, yeah. Or, or that it kind of goes on for longer, if you like. So, yeah. So let's, um, I want to give the audience a chance to ask questions. Um, but I want to ask you two questions that relate a little more to your uh, previous professional career. Oh, um, the okay. first one is um, about the Federal Reserve. Uh, how do you think it's operated over the past two, three years? You know, why do we have so much inflation? What went wrong there? Uh, you know, whatever you want to say about that. You're going to give me the second question as well. The second question is going to be about the uh, economy of the United Kingdom. Oh my goodness! And I'll give, I'll give, um, a, I'll give a long answer to see. It's useful to know. Yeah, that. yeah. I'll give a long answer. The, the, the questions would, would include questions such as. Uh, why have the past few months been such a shambolic disaster? Um, did the Bank of England engage in what one former Fed governor referred to as a coup when they uh, were former involved in removing uh, former, so, former, Fed, former, former regional former, Fed president? Who, he's a friend of mine, but remember that they're in the entertainment business. And that was a piece of entertainment. <laughs> so, are, so are many British politicians, of course, that they're still doing the, the same sport, I think. It, uh, but so what, okay, what, do, what do you Reserve. think of that assessment? You can do I, the Federal Reserve first. Okay, no, 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 no I'll do the Federal yeah. Reserve first. It's much more important. Yeah. Um, I do not think the Federal Reserve has done well. I do not think the ECB has done well, although they have a much harder job. I don't think the Bank of England has done well. Um, I, I think they were, I would not have funded, I think it was right and sensible that there was a great deal of fiscal support for both our countries um, during COVID for households and small firms. I think that should have been funded in the debt markets rather than by printing money. Why people thought that that had to be funded by the Federal Reserve is beyond me. It will turn out to be incredibly costly um, in the long run because they could have locked in um, very low um, long borrowing rates. Um, I have nothing. Um, so you think rate So that's 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 but that's so what I just said. So you think shouldn't have done its credit market interventions, basically. In after after they should have they should have stabilized the treasury market in the spring of 2020, but as a kind of market maker of last resort operation. That's before the Biden 
fiscal stimulus. Before the Cares Act. Yeah, when, when people criticize the fiscal stimulus on macroeconomic grounds, they have the wrong target. Uh, elected governments are entitled to do whatever they do. The whole point about the sequential game, it's a Stachelberg game, fiscal authority moves first, monetary authority moves second. The whole point is that the monetary authority can offset excess demand if it, judge, if it judges there to be excess demand. That leaves all the distributional stuff and good works and bad works that fiscal policy does completely intact other than its macro thing. Then macro effects. Then the question is, was it reasonable to think that the Biden, administ Biden fiscal package was going to create um, inflation? Um, I have two things to say about that. One is, the people that said it would got attacked, not just professionally, got attacked personally. And I, the thing I was taught, one of the best things I was taught by my bosses in the 80s and 90s is that even if we despise some of the people out there, they sometimes have really good arguments and you know, take the arguments seriously, don't think about the man or the woman. I think both people in the White House and people in the Federal Reserve fell down on that, which is unfortunate when they at least look to have been wrong. Um, the, the second thing to say about Well, as it, you know, every is, economic on. policy debate within the Democratic Party is whether people like Larry Summers or not. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it's... it's but but it's, go on, sorry. Yeah. The, it wasn't just against Larry. Um, the second thing is that even if you didn't think that... Even if one thought that the central outlook for inflation was benign, if you ask the second moment question, as economists would call it, did you think the risks were symmetric or did you think they were asymmetric, no one that is any good at that job um, could easily get to their symmetric. Um, they were um, almost certainly asymmetric, and you're meant to feed back from the mean. You're meant to take that asymmetry into From the account. perspective of the monetary authority. From the perspective yeah. of the monetary um, authority. And then, so I think that right from the beginning, they should have wanted to... Uh, it's not just that they didn't tighten policy. They kept on adding to the easing. So you combine the two, oh, this argument's rubbish, coming from a rubbish source, and actually we, we're, we're going to carry on adding to the stimulus. Yeah, not on ba um, best form during that period. This isn't just a point about the Fed, though. This is true elsewhere. And I think the interesting questions are not whether there were mistakes. It's, these are some of the most professional organizations in any field in the world, and I've seen inside lots of private sector institutions. The interesting questions about why they made the mistakes, how did they come to make those mistakes so that they can avoid them in future. I do not think those mistakes would have been made um, over the previous um, period. And I think it's something to do with um, running for reappointment, but more than that, distraction with other missions, climate change, social justice. And they may be more important than price stability, but they belong in other in other agencies. You can only, if you have all the power of an independent central bank, it's really important you at least deliver on the thing that only you can do. To what extent do you think that was reflected in the framework the Federal Reserve adopted? Oh, I think that was very, it's very, very poorly done. It's, it's the, the whole consultative process was poorly done, but I could bore you with that. But you don't, you don't design a regime for only one kind of bad state of the world, one where you can't get inflation up. You, you, have to, you have to design these regimes for as many different kinds of bad states of the world, plausible bad states of the world, as you can, as you can think of. And um, so I'm speaking with no scientists. Well, what have they done? Wow. And I think it, it matters that they conducted the, the review in a strange way. They conducted it in a way where they had to conclude that there would be material change. And you, if you don't want to box yourself into that, the very first part of stage of a review typically four stages of review, I won't take you through them. The very first stage, if you don't want to box yourself in, you have to frame yourself, have to frame it in a way that doing nothing or next to nothing will not be the slightest bit embarrassing in a meaningful way. And I think they felt, you know, I've seen this before, and, you know, the Federal Reserve's a great institution, and this will be not its greatest episode, but it's not a threat to the institution or to the role of the dollar as an international reserve currency. They are playing catch-up. They're now more likely to make more mistakes having made uh, mistakes earlier because it's now much... What they're doing now, I think, I think earlier on it would have been quite easy. They're now doing things that I would find really, really difficult because it's not clear whether the anchor is quite as secure as it has been. I'm sorry for that by way into...
the peculiar cul-de-sac of monetary Well, now we're going stuff. to England. Oh, England. Um, whatever one thinks about Brexit, I think it's a fact that the, 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 leading, the leaders in the Brexit movement didn't have one clear conception of what Brexit would mean for, for policy. And, and there's been, if you like, a kind of a political market in what Brexit means going on since um, Brexit. This comes back actually to something that was Jeff was saying about constitutions. I mean, I think that's the kind of, again, without hindsight, I think there should have been two referenda. One, one for whether or not to leave, and then if the answer was <coughs> stay, that's the end of it. If the answer is leave, then a second referendum for the package. That would have raised, a two-step referendum raises the chances of the first referendum being to leave, which is why I suspect that David and George didn't want to, want to do that. But I think if you think to the end of the process, you end in a different place because then the Tory party would have, and others would have had to come to a view of what Brexit meant. And instead, that's a, you know, market, market price discovery. Well, they're discovering works, it works. now. It, and political, pr political policy discovery is a more awkward process than price discovery in an efficient market. Mm -hmm. I think that's for sure. Um, I have a, w one question here from uh, uh, an online person, uh, and then we'll turn to the room. Paul, in a previous discussion on this book, you noted that China seeks respect from the West. Oh, yes. Which the West largely has not shown so far. What does Western, quote, uh, respect, unquote, of China look like to you? And how, if at all, could this be done while still allowing the West to hold true to its values? One of Jeff or Hal said something that reminded me of this, and then I've forgotten which is that China often say that they want respect from the West and, and are aggrieved that respect isn't conveyed. And I, I think it's important to distinguish between two types of respect. There's respect as recognition and there's respect as esteem. And China are ambiguous as to which they want. If it's respect as recognition, in international relations, this means respect in international law, the sovereign state, yes, granted, WTO, equal power, yes, IMF, not equal, smaller, quota, and you could go through and it's just a series of positive things. The point about respect as esteem, which they sometimes sound as though they want, which, which means individual major figures sound as though they want that from us to China, is if you want respect for esteem, this isn't just about countries, it's true among people, organizations, you're actually um, acquiescing in the norms of the person or state that may or may not bestow esteem. So it's a really, really, most of all, I think that China's kind of demand for esteem is a really interesting thing. Um, and I think one would have to be a real China hand and China scholar to kind of make sense of that. It's, it's, it's very striking to me that it isn't just framed in terms of, of respect as recognition, um, that they want something more. Now, certainly we can celebrate um, their, their history, but, but nor should we be awed by the continuity of their history. Well, no more than we should be awed by the continuity of our history, um, which is a magnificent thing, an equally magnificent thing. So I don't kind of buy the we've been a state for two and a half thousand years thing, you know. In one sense, we've all been Aristotelian for quite a while too. All right, let's take a couple of questions from the room. Let's first go over here, orange tie. Uh, hold on, please wait for the mic and then briefly introduce yourself, ask a question. You know uh, thank you, uh, Bert Ely, a banking consultant. Um, my question is, uh, to what extent is the discord you refer to in the book's title driven by financial crises? And uh, as a follow-on, to what extent uh, should such crises, that such crises uh, are triggering discord, what action should the market economies take to reduce that discord? I think the discord has deeper roots. Um, I think financial crises are very bad for us at a strategic level. As obviously they're bad for us economically and socially and culturally, and it turns out here and in my country constitutionally, 
um, not for the first time in history when it comes to financial and economic crises. Um, I think what it means for policy is that the West can't afford another financial crisis. This is the tone, note on which, another way of putting the point that I was ending on. I think that ensuring our financial system is resilient is incredibly important. And when all the lobbyists, I mean, here I'm absolutely with Jeff, when all the lobbyists argue for this or that and the other, somebody somewhere has to, you know, wants presidents to do this and others. Um, really big fix to come and say, no, 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 no. We can't afford um, to take risks with the stability of our financial um, system. I feel very strongly about, about that and therefore very frustrated. Let's go over here. Uh, I take a bit of your water? Yeah. Right. Um, over there. Oh. Leave mine alone. Okay. No, it's yours. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, so Stan, I pass them as well. Well, we're chained to our seats. So we're chained to our It's all right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what a nice thing to do. <laughs> we can't move because we're all, oh. we've been chained to the... This is fantastic, actually. What are your memories of speaking at the AI? Well, it's a kind of, you know, libertarian kind of place. <laughs> and and uh, curiously, we were chained to our chairs. A not, a not so spontaneous order. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question about pluralism. So in democracies, domestically, it sort of seems like pluralism is a way to further domestic legitimacy in democracies. Yet internationally, it seems like it's sort of the opposite, where democracies promote their values. Yeah. And China, at least nominally, talks about like a democracy of the international order, even if in reality that's not an yeah. you know, actual thing. But, and it seems like this tension sort of manifests itself both domestically in terms of foreign influence, going back to like the Jene affair in the long 18th century, and also internationally in the international organizations like the UN, where we have uh, international organizations established in the West, by the West, on the basis of political pluralism, but also there's a conflict within the West and other nations, uh, authoritarian nations, um, between our values and their values. So how do you think this tension um, manifests itself, and how do we deal with this tension, both in the general philosophical sense and in the sense of these, these specific examples? I think it, it's a really great question. Um, I, I think it partly manifests itself in self-deception. So we kind of tell ourselves um, compellingly um, that we live in pluralist societies. America's a pluralist society, my country is. And therefore that our societies are quite thin. But actually they're thicker than we think is, is, is I think, the self-deception. Because we think our, we've come to think of our Cells, is living in pluralist societies which are inevitably thin, and therefore we can take this thin society to the rest of the world and say, you should be like that too. This is the, this is, but actually that's saying, um, well, all thin societies should look like the one that we've developed, which is quite a thick demand um, in, in, in a way. And the, the, the concentric circles things is functional in some senses. It's you know, in the outer circle of the um, something I say somewhere that, you know, the problem with Rawls's thing is that all the indecent states are small. As I say, you can't keep somebody, you can't push, push somebody beyond the pale unless you can keep them there. This is brutally realist. Uh, there are no values there. Um, if you need peaceful existence to have any kind of cooperative arrangements at all, then you will need to make compromises of that. And I see international law functioning um, for what it's worth Kind of at that thin level of, of the concentric circles. So for, for those people that push much thicker versions of inter international law, it's, they, they typically um, um, execute a very careful elision where the, what they're really doing is campaigning. There's nothing wrong with campaigning, but campaigning is wrapped up as, as a kind of normative um, often as a normative deduction from some Kantian duty of justice to others or something. And I, I think that, I don't just think it's kind of, I mean, I, I prefer Hume. It's not just that I think, I don't find that intellectually appealing. I actually think it's against our interests. Um, because the people, that if, if we deceive ourselves, they won't be deceived. They'll say, I mean, some of the be most interesting writing about international law comes from Japanese scholars who live in both 
constitutional democracy and have somewhat different articulations of why human rights um, um, would matter. And I think we're just not, I've ended up thinking actually that we should be much more attentive to thinkers in Japan and Korea because they're all already living this kind of Confucian heritage meets constitutional democracy thing. And I think it's, it's not that I kind of aesthetically object to the arrogance of Kantian declaration, which is where I think a lot of modern scholarship, not Jeff, has been living for a long time. Um, I think it doesn't actually serve our interests, including in preserving our deepest values in, as it, it instantiated, animated in our way of life. That actually, if you, you know, the reason I think it's a great question is this goes absolutely to the core. You know, right at the very heart of the book, there's a point. It's that point. So, uh, uh, that's got Matthias, yeah. Thank you very much, Matthias Mateus. I'm an associate professor next door at SAIS. Um, Paul, if you'll indulge me, can I ask you a central bank question oh. and a Brexit question? Oh, so damn. on um, quantitative easing, when the European Central Bank started doing this in earnest in, I guess, January 2015, the first thought I had is like, we're never going to get out of this, are we? In a way that the, the amounts of money we were buying on a monthly basis as the Fed and the BOE had already been doing it since, I guess, 2009. And I think we're seeing this now to some extent, right? I mean, going back to normal for many people still means going back to, I guess, pre-2008 levels, maybe not quite as low. But so if you think about ECB, they want to sell bonds for which there's no market right now because they bought everything, Estonian bonds, Latvian bonds, things like this, right? So. My simple question on that is, are we ever going to get out of this, mm -hmm. out, of out of a world of quantitative easing, or do we live in a fundamentally new kind of monetary reality? It probably harks back to your previous book on, on elected power as well a bit. Well, and then on, on I Brexit... Don't mind, I don't mind advertising that one. Too, so. <clears throat> Excellent. And then on, on Brexit, I'm always struck every six months there's a new survey that shows a slightly higher percentage of people in Britain that think it was a bad idea. <laughs> to me, the basic explanation is that another half a million Brits have died who disproportionately voted for it. And then another bunch of younger people have come of age that see the, the drama of the last six years that they're living through. So under what conditions is there a new societal demand for another referendum that you mentioned earlier? So on the first, yes, you'll, you'll see a world where QE is gone. I've got no idea when it will come. I thought the ECB started it rather late. They certainly started it at a point at which one might have been concerned that it was going to go on for much, much longer than my generation of policymakers had ever dreamt of. I think the thing that you introduce, the consideration you introduce about what it does to underlying markets, they, they should have been alert to that because Japan has wrestled with that. And I think one should, I think, I think the Western central banks haven't been nearly enough interested in Japan's circumstances. And actually, I, I believe for a long time um, that there's a kind of tinge of soft racism in that, that somehow Japan's different. Of course, they screw things up. It never happened um, here. And of course, some version of it has, has happened here. But also, and attentiveness to markets, the, you know, the standard story now of uh, Britain's rise during the 18th century is the financial reforms and fostering markets, the government bonds fostering markets for bills of exchange, which is one of the reasons campaigners here wanted a Federal Reserve in the run-up to um, 1913. Um, on, on, um, on Brexit, I think it's better, you know, it, it, this is so, I'm, it's not that I want to evade the question because it's controversial. I, I think that the risk with it being so controversial is that it, 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 for people that feel very strongly about Remain or getting back into the EU in some form, it acts as a distraction um, or set of blinkers from Brexit happened because there were lots of very unhappy people in my country and they were very unhappy for kind of tangible material reasons. I can remember, I'm not gonna name the two individuals, I can remember when somebody became a leader of one of the two main parties and it meant that both party leaders were metropolitan and uh, we had some friends around at home, and I just lost it. I'm from the provinces. 
kind of largest village in the middle of the country. And I thought, you know, they're just going to be completely alienated, not by these two people ad hominem, they're both men, who the country can bet, never know in a real sense, but because they're so obviously metropolitan and we've got so many problems um, out there outside London. And it, held, you know, it matters to my country that London is so, central London, is so rich. I'm going to say something that sounds ridiculous. When Sophie, my wife, and I moved to Boston from London in the late 2013, our first response was, oh, oh, oh. And it took us a little while to go, oh, no, no. Nowhere else is like, like London. Nowhere for the time being. That will change. And you bet the rest of it, most of the rest of England, Cambridge aside, isn't like uh, London. And, and that happened while we were in the EU. And so I think, I think if, if Brexit has had any salutary effects in terms of that problem, it's made it easier to talk about those problems than it was um, before. You can see, you know, you can hear the policymaker, former policymaker, thinking, you know, what I'm looking for windows to do things, and you can be ready with ideas, and oh, it's there, right, go. Um, the window's opened. It's not obvious to me that anyone has been very clear about what they want to do with that window. Um, but windows have opened to do things that I think were, were either closed or invisible um, before. I think it's two years after Jeremy Corbyn passes away. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I wanted to ask one more. Do you think we should have done, do you think it's uh, reasonable that we're doing the World Cup in Qatar? I think the, the serious question to take away is one around corruption and compromise in international sports organizations and thinking about you know, how on earth was the Olympics in Berlin in 1936? I mean, how on earth? How on earth? And we all watch those pictures. I mean, you know, one of the proofs that God exists is Jesse Owens winning those races. And we have to hope that something kind of somehow happens this time where we can, you know, generations later will think, wow, wow, there was a kind of, there was a signal of goodness amongst all of, of that. But the, the, it's a, the point criticizing the hosts, it's people elsewhere decided um, on these things, and they've made lots of other bad decisions as, as well. And when you're taking decisions, of course you should think about everything. Of course you should. Hell, Jeff, any closing comments? No, not for me. Bill wanted to come in at one point. There's oh. Conway. Okay. Uh, Stanley Kober. I was a student in the Soviet Union, just missed Putin at Leningrad University. We all studied Soviet Marxist system, but something I noticed with the Soviet students, they weren't so respectful of the Communist Party even back then. Yeah. They resented it. Why can the American students come over here? We can't travel without permission. They resented it. 15 years later, it all collapsed. The Berlin Wall, they pushed on it. They wanted it over. In talking to Chinese students here, I've noticed something similar. I don't hear a lot of respect for the Communist Party. What they talk about, if you're talking about values, is parents. As one of the students told me, our parents want the best for us. And the best is in American education. I get this talk, this respect for parents from the students all the time, not the Communist Party. As one of them told me, the Communist Party doesn't make it easy for us. And I'm wondering if we're making the same mistake that we made with the Soviet Union, thinking the party was so enduring, not listening even to the children of the elite. They're over here. And I have to ask you, if you talk about values, do you ever talk to your students? You, you teach at universities. Do you ever listen to your students and what they say? Can you, can you, uh, this is really interesting. Can you just expand on the significance of the last thing um, you, were, you were saying? Because the, the, the implication is what? Of the values. As, uh, let me put it differently. We talk about dictatorship against democracy. When I mentioned this to one of my Chinese friends, she just laughed. Who wants to live in a dictatorship? I don't see this among the young people. 
So it says I didn't see it among my Soviet contemporaries. So it's not obvious. I've, I've got it. So it's not obvious to me that we did make lots of mistakes with the Soviet Union. It just took a long time because they were very powerful and very um, rich. I think China is even more powerful and certainly a lot richer. And so it might take um, longer. And certainly in terms of hoping for any kind of um, adjustment in their political system, I think it would be huge. This goes back to the previous question. I, I absolutely am not in favor of international organizations proselytizing or trying to enforce democracy. Um, I, I, I think this is a kind of P-Lite view, P-Lite in the middle of the 19th century, addressing Palmerston and saying people have to find their own way to liberty. And this is a kind of, I regard this as a kind of almost tragic realist thought about the world. I don't think you can go and say, and you'll have liberty as I've designed it in the, in the Rawlsian students' um, class. I think that's a mistake. My experience of Chinese students in, in Harvard is that um, having attended, I don't know whether you've spoken at the China event, um, is that some are very loyal to the regime, certainly in outward performance, but it struck me as sincere for what it's worth, and others um, more, more kind of questioning um, of it. Um, I think it's also fair to say there, you know, we, we sadly live in an age where quite a few students are rather questioning about our regime <laughs> um, and the problems that, that, that we've got. But, I mean, of course their views will matter because that's who it's for. Jeff Powell, no? Good. Thank you all for uh, coming. Thank you, people on the internet. Uh, <laughs>